Every summer, my grandparents would go on a cruise. They had both worked incredibly hard their entire lives, and in retirement would treat themselves to a couple of holidays a year. They had a lovely home that I'd spent every Saturday night at as a child. Every summer when they went on their cruise, they would ask me to stay and look after the dog. I loved it. I was in my early 20s and still lived at home with my parents. This was the chance for a bit of independence and to have the house to myself. I'd done it for a few years up until this point, and then instead of throwing parties with my friends which I'd previously done, I was looking forward to spending some time with my girlfriend and chilling out. My grandparents filled the fridge with my favourite foods, always left me a bit of spending money, and my granddad would always leave me a crate of beer in the garage. Awesome. The first night, me and my then girlfriend didn't do anything special. We loved the freedom and loved that we were going to spend a full two weeks together by ourselves. We watched a movie and decided we were going to bed. While she was in the bathroom, all the power was cut in the house. Nothing out of the ordinary. I went into the kitchen, found the switchboard, and boom, there was a light. We got in bed, put the telly on, and went to sleep. I remember waking up, and there was screaming coming from the TV. I looked at the dressing table clock and saw that the time was 3.33. I immediately laughed it off and dozed back to sleep. The next day, we both went to work and both returned to my grandparents' house in the early evening. We chilled out doing whatever young couples do and decided it was time to go to bed. Before I went to bed, though I'd always let Bonnie out, my grandparents' beautiful dog, to go and do her business in the backyard. My grandparents' back door led into a conservatory, which then led to a patio, which then led onto the back garden. I unlocked the back door, turned on the lights to the conservatory and patio, and moved towards the conservatory door. Bonnie didn't move from the back door. After a bit of convincing with rich tea biscuits, I managed to convince her to go to the conservatory. There was no way I wasn't letting her out and having to scrape up dog poop the following morning. I unlocked the conservatory door onto the patio, and before I had a chance to fully open the door, there was a large thud that came from the conservatory window on my right. I stood frozen for what felt like an hour. I calmly closed the door and stood in shock, wondering what it could be. I wasn't scared at this point, just incredibly startled. I looked down at Bonnie, who was staring up at me, and decided it would be fine if she did a business in the house that night. I went to bed with my heart still pounding, but didn't mention it to my girlfriend. I awoke the next night with someone on the television, screaming at 3.33. The next day was my day off from work. My girlfriend was working though. I had the house to myself. I had nothing special planned. I was just going to chill out and play some PlayStation. I'd pretty much shrugged off the thud ordeal in the conservatory from the night before. Bonnie hadn't left any presents for me, but she did run the fastest I've ever seen her run out onto the back garden when I opened the doors that morning. I couldn't stop thinking about being woken up at 3.33 for two consecutive nights. I wondered what the consequences of it happening three times might be. I laughed it off again and tried to enjoy the rest of my day off. Mid-afternoon, I received a phone call from my girlfriend telling me that her car had broken down while at work. This was a huge bummer because we lived over 70 miles apart and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to see her for a while until it was fixed. She apologised that she wouldn't be able to stay with me while I was dog sitting, but I told her not to be daft and that we'll see each other again as soon. That afternoon, I went for a shower. I was just lathering myself up when I heard the phone ring. I let it ring knowing that if it's important, it will go to the answering machine and I can ring them back. The ringing stopped and immediately began once again. I thought that it must be important, so I ran out of the shower, suds and all, to grab the phone. When I answered, no one was there. Just silence. No dial tone. Someone was on the line, but not talking. I must have said hello a dozen times before the line cut dead, and the second it did, the doorbell rang. Now I was in a precarious position, I'd run out of the shower full-blown naked to answer the phone and not take a towel with me. The phone I'd answered was in the kitchen, and the front door was at the end of the hallway on my right. I sheepishly stuck my head around the corner towards the front door to see who it was. There was no one there. Only a couple seconds had passed, but whoever had rang the doorbell 
was already gone. I wasn't scared or concerned, it was, as it was broad daylight. I got back in the shower and within a minute, the phone and the doorbell were ringing at the same time. I immediately got out of the shower, wrapped myself up in a towel and headed for the door. No one was there. The phone had stopped ringing the second I left the shower. I carried on with the rest of my day and that night I didn't wake up at all, much to my relief. The next day I was in the living room watching television. I was sitting in my granddad's electric reclining chair. It was a comfy beast. It was placed in the far left corner of the living room with the TV in the far right. On the left of the chair was the window looking out towards the street. The window was huge. It was actually three separate windows with a beautiful pattern running through all three. While I was watching television, the doorbell rang. This was quite strange, as my grandparents lived on the corner of a cul-de-sac, and if anyone had driven or walked to the door, I would have seen them. I didn't think much of it, as I must have been engrossed in whatever rubbish I'd been watching. Bonnie was up on all fours in the hallway, staring at the door. I thought that maybe it was my auntie, making sure I'd not burned the house down. When I got to the door, no one was there, again. Now I was becoming a little more distressed, and being by myself was making it worse. I thought that maybe it was burglars scoping the place out, seeing if anyone was home. That night, just before bed, I went to let Bonnie out. I opened the back door, turned on the lights at the conservatory and patio, and opened the conservatory door. To my horror, on the patio was a mangled bird. It had no head, and the left side of its body had been torn off by something. What shocked me the most was that it was still walking about. I didn't know what to do, so I rang my girlfriend. I was explaining to her what I'd seen, and when I looked back onto the patio, the bird had gone. I went outside to check to see if I could find it, but it had buggered off like it was never there. I decided that Bonnie could do her business in the house again, if she must. At this point, it was all becoming a little too much for me. I spoke to my auntie and asked if my cousin and his girlfriend wanted the dog sit instead. I explained that my girlfriend couldn't stay anymore anyway, and that they'd probably appreciate the time alone. They obviously jumped to the chance. Cowardice, I know. That night, I went home and thought that it would now all be over. I was wrong. Dead wrong. A few days after I'd got back into my comfort zone, and was just sitting watching TV in my bedroom, when out of nowhere, there were two loud strums on my acoustic guitar. I sat there in disbelief for a moment, but then decided I'd had enough. I asked whoever did it to do it again. The hairs on my arms rose with anticipation and fear. I asked multiple times, but nothing. I decided it's probably best I went downstairs where my sister and mum were. As I went downstairs, I heard the guitar fall over. I couldn't bring myself to tell them what had happened for fear of them thinking I'm nuts. Another few days had gone by at this point. I was exhausted, even though nothing serious had happened. And I'm not seeing anything. I felt like I was going crazy. I decided that it's probably best that I have an early night. I put the television on for background noise and faced the wall. Within seconds, I heard my television shut off, followed by heavy breathing. I laid with my eyes shut, terrified as I heard the breathing get closer. It was deliberate and calculated. Each step it got closer, the louder the breathing got. I was frozen in fright. As it approached the bed, I could feel its breath on the back of my head. Every hair on my body stood up as I could feel whatever it was lurking over my body. A few agonising silent seconds passed, followed by a gigantic roar in my ear. I jumped to my feet from a laid down position, something that I don't think I'll ever be able to do again. I stood there breathless and pouring in sweat. I was absolutely terrified. I looked at my clock and saw it was 2.15 in the morning. I'd gone to sleep around nine-ish. What felt like seconds had actually been hours. Scared to go back to sleep, I tiptoed downstairs not to wake anyone. But to my surprise, all the lights were on. I walked into the living room and my mum was awake having a cigarette. I asked what she was doing up so late and she explained to me that she'd just had a horrible dream in which me, my sister, her and my stepdad all awoke in the middle of the night 
because things were floating around the house. We'd all gained telekinetic powers and could control anything within the house. I laughed along as she explained the ludicrous dream until she got to the end. At the end of the dream, we were all downstairs, dumbfounded as to what was going off around us. And then we all heard a terrifying roar come from upstairs. We crept as a family up the stairs, following the sounds from above. As we got to the top, it was apparent that the sounds were coming from my room. We went in together and all gasped as we saw a demonic hand open the hatch to the attic. That's when she woke up and the dream ended. I didn't share my dream. Later that morning, I became so tired that I could no longer resist sleep and got back into bed. Looking at the hatch that led to the attic, I dreamt that something was trying to pull me out of bed by my feet and when I awoke the next morning, my right foot was covered in scratches. The events had really begun to take a toll on my mental well-being. I daren't sleep and I didn't want to be left alone. I dreaded coming home from work, but over another few more days without incident, I was starting to feel a bit better and less like a nutter. I was at home with my mum playing some PlayStation in my room, when my mum asked if I wanted anything from the shop. I told her I was fine and didn't want anything, so she left. The second she left, there was a loud bang that came from her room. At this point, I'd had enough. Just like when my guitar had played, I encouraged it to do it again. This time it immediately responded with two large bangs. I rose up from my chair and walked onto the landing where all the bedrooms met. I stood there, staring intently into my mother's bedroom. It was pitch black. I asked them to do it again. This time, nothing. I walked into her room and turned on her light to see books laid out across the floor. Obviously the cause of the noises I'd heard. I'd stood in the middle of the room and dared them to do it again. A madman talking to himself in his parents' bedroom. Nothing. I'd had my fill of whatever had been happening to me and decided that enough was enough. I told them exactly what I thought of them, using every expletive that I could think of. Some manic, crazed lunatic screaming at the abyss, telling them to fuck off. A few minutes later, my mother came back from the shop. I went downstairs and explained everything that I'd gone through over the last couple of weeks. She patiently listened to me and it felt great to get this nightmarish burden off of my chest. When I finished, she told me that her, my stepdad and sister, have always feared my bedroom, and it's always made them feel uneasy to enter when I'm not there. She also told me a story where while I was with my grandparents, her and my stepdad had an argument, so my dad had decided to sleep in my bed, but he hurriedly ran back to their room as something had pushed him while he was trying to sleep. She also told me that the reason I slept with the TV on is when I was a child, my actual dad passed away and my granddad told me that my dad would come to visit me while I was sleeping. Instead of this being comforting though, it terrified me so I could never sleep in the dark. Since that day, I've never had any more experiences. I still regularly visit my grandparents at their home as they're still going strong in their 80s, and I check back in just as much with the parentos. My room is exactly the same as when I left. No one dares enter when I'm not there. I was surprised that when I moved out years ago, that my sister never took it because her bedroom was tiny, but the unnerving presence felt towards it was too much for her. This house is definitely haunted, but I think it has more to do with the house's history. It was a very large boarding house before my dad bought it. There are a lot of doors because of that, and my bedroom door even still has a number on it from when it was. I have so many stories, I don't even know where to start. A lot of them revolved around my older daughter, who seemed to be the focus of a lot of activity. I'll start with one more recent one. One day, we heard a crash above us from the attic that sounded like a piano being dropped. My husband was bathing our child, so I got my dad, who was working, and we went upstairs. When we got up there, we didn't see anything that fell. We did however find a wooden plank that was nailed in the middle of the size of a street sign. On the plank there were initials written in fresh chalk. Never had seen it before and neither had my dad. That was one of the very first incidents. 
So last year I was pregnant and having a new baby in December. And I've been scouring the attic for my newborn clothes from my first. I was up there two days prior searching all over, including this spot. I went out that afternoon and sent my husband up there to find stuff. And when I got home, I went up to talk to him and he showed me this handmade wooden cross thing hanging from the board with the initials on it from a dog leash. I was so freaked out because I know for a fact that it was not there the other day. I would have hit my head on it. I texted my brother who works at a funeral home if he had been up there. Only entrance to the attic is in my apartment and he insisted that he had not been up there but that he did make the cross out of Lincoln Logs when he was a kid. So I knew who made it but we had no idea why it was all of a sudden hanging there in plain sight. My husband really thought someone was messing with us or I just didn't see it the other day but there's no way in hell I didn't see it hanging at eye level. He took it down and swung it back over. It was dangling down. My brother is freaked out now too because he made the cross but he didn't attach the dog leash. We don't even have a dog. The leash was most likely from my brother's girlfriend dog when they lived there but I'd never even seen it. It was so creepy and I never figure out what it was. So a lot of my paranormal experiences have involved my daughter who is now 7. It slowed down a lot for a few years but actually started up again a lot more when I was pregnant with my second last year. But there have been really creepy things. My daughter has said. These are all for when she was between 2 and 3 because she was talking but still very young. One night I was sitting on her bed tucking her in. We had the lights out but a pretty bright night light and I was singing to her like I do every single night. All of a sudden she pulled the blanket up to her face and had a weird look. She then says to me, Mommy, the man said to stop singing. I was thinking, uh, what? She was now hiding under the covers and was actually really scared. So I said, who said that baby? And she pointed over and said, the man over there doesn't like it. I'm not gonna lie. I'm totally embarrassed that I'm a shit mom apparently, but I tucked her in and left real quick. I felt bad I wasn't going to scare her more. She was okay when I left. She has said so many weird things. Once she said to me, my friend Ida comes to visit me at night. She has long black hair and a black dress and black shoes. I asked her, oh really? Does she live here or just come to visit? And she said, she just came to visit her. She was not even three and I had never spoken of anyone named Ida ever. Another time, she told me there was an owl in her closet at night that made noise and also told me that her little birdhouse that she had hanging in a room had someone in it that talked to her. There was a time at my parents' house. We were sitting at the dinner table and it was in an alcove type area with windows all around facing just all the woods. All of a sudden, she stops in a high chair and gets super serious and says, Shh! Everyone be quiet. There's a ghost in the trees. And pointed outside. It was terrifying. She was always talking to someone in her room and always saying weird things that she shouldn't know. Now I want to be clear. Even though my house is definitely haunted, I don't feel threatened. It's just there. My husband and I to this day feel ice cold movement that comes and goes. We hear banging at night. We hear voices. We've had things go missing. I'll be in bed and think that someone came in when they didn't. Or something will hit the bed when I'm alone. We also have a ghost cat who jumps on our bed and has even touched us. But this happened about six years ago. My daughter was supposed to be napping. She was in her crib and I was laying down in my bedroom with the video baby monitor. I kept checking it because she was unusually riled up and talking and laughing and just wouldn't go to sleep. She, but she wasn't crying, at least so I let her be. A few minutes later I picked up the monitor to check and when I picked it up I thought she was sitting on the right side of the crib. Then a second later I realised that she was standing to the left. So what the fuck is that sitting on the right? It was clearly a baby. I watched it on the monitor. 
It moved its head a few times, which scared the shit out of me. I took a picture of the screen for proof. I went in a few minutes later, calming down, and she was laying down. There was no stuffed animals of any kind in there. I checked. There was not a cross connection with another monitor because it was the only one that had absolutely no internet hookup. Just a camera and a hand screen. It was so insane. I actually had a ghost hunting group ask to come to my house, but I declined because I really didn't want to know. And or to make it worse. It wasn't hurting anyone at least. Interestingly enough, my dad said that the people who lived here before it became a boarding house was a family that had several kids and apparently they had maids who lived in the attic. Just so many crazy things that have happened, but this one was so scary. This is an ongoing thing right now in the house I live in. My family moved into the house in early April. My mother and her friend were just at the house before my brother and I moved in. When my mother's friend was going outside to smoke, he saw a shadow near this metal sheet shed we have. He told my mother, but she thought he was just messing with her. For a couple of weeks I was home alone and I kept hearing noises which was common because there is a tree branch on the roof above my room. But then I start hearing talking. I then pull out my phone to record and I catch someone saying hello. It was normal for neighbours to come over and talk, but this was at 2am. I still check the porch for people, but there's nothing. I hear things coming from my brother's room, and we have a connected bathroom. So I step out of my room and see that his door is closed. I go in the restroom and swing open the door, and when I do, I see his door is open. So I sweep the house for people. I end up not finding anyone. When my mom comes home a week later, I go to, the sh to show her the video, but I must have deleted it because it wasn't there. She said she didn't believe me, but still had her friend who was a priest come by and bless the house. Another week goes by and my brother is back, and I see him keep looking down the hall. I tell him, yeah, I keep thinking I see someone there too. He agrees with me that he thinks he sees someone. Then another week, my sister comes over. It's about 9pm. So I'm just about to go to sleep. I hear a knocking, but I just close my eyes and try to sleep. But my brother comes in the room and says sister is in the bathroom and freaking out. I go and ask her if she heard the knock too. She replies with, that wasn't y'all messing with me. It was knocking on the bathroom door. She got scared and began crying. She called our mom and told her what happened. She says she's been drinking so can't drive home. I grab my dad's knife and searched the house and then the yard. Nobody was there, and all of the doors were locked. So this story involves the same place, but a few different scenarios. So back when I was in college, I dated a guy whose childhood home was very close to the university we both attended. Now this house is part of a historical home district in the south. Where if a home is of a certain age, you're not allowed to change it or destroy it. Any updates must be approved by the city and retain the historical integrity of the home. Or to say, this home was essentially almost the exact same since it was built in the 1800s. Now, we would often hang out at this house to visit family, and would sometimes stay over to keep his dad company. Knowing I love ghosts and a good history lesson, he had informed me that growing up the family had seen ghostly apparitions and experienced a few things themselves. So before I start my story, I'll explain a few of the others from their perspective. The way the home was built there was the kitchen and living space downstairs and the master bedroom. There was also a second story that involved a tiny wooden staircase that led to a long hallway with a bedroom to the left at the top of the stairs. A bedroom almost directly in front of the stairway exit and then a bedroom to the right at the far end of the hallway. The bedroom on the far right was mostly used for storage and that's it. He informed me he and his sister would sometimes see an apparition in this room of a woman in 1800s fashion clothes, hair in a bun, full bottom petticoat etc. And she would always be looking out longingly through the window in that bedroom. If approached, she would always disappear. 
The second story was one that my ex and his mother had experienced. His mother unfortunately passed away from an illness, and at this time, she was progressively getting sicker. I say this because, as some people say, the closer you are to birth or death, the easier for you to see or relate to spirits. Anyways, the ex was stopping by his home to pick up some items and just run in and out. He had parked his car on the driveway that was visible from the windows when in the sitting room. He ran in, grabbed his stuff, saw his mother in the sitting room and said hello. He made it to his car with his items and got back in when his mother called him on his phone asking him, Why didn't you tell me you had a guest with you? You should know better than not to introduce a guest when you bring them over. It's in the south, traditions and such. He was confused and had no idea what she was talking about. He asked her back, What do you mean? Is it just me here? To which she replied, No, there's a girl sitting in your passenger seat. I can see her right now. To which he then noped the hell out of his vehicle and went back inside. There were also random bangs and noises that one always just chalks up to living in an old house. However, whenever we would stay over, I would always have the same dream of what looked like someone in the shape of a man that looked like a black shadow always standing at the edge of our bed. Now, this is the real incident I experienced on my own. One day when I was attending class, I realised I forgot to print out something for a presentation. And as I mentioned, his house was close by to the school. I checked with him to see if it was okay if I ran back to his dad's home and printed off my assignment there. He said that that was no issue and that his dad was actually in a business meeting, so he wouldn't even be home, so I wasn't bothering anyone. I rushed over to the house and up the stairs to the bedroom which had the printer in it. I happened to close the bedroom door for some reason and got on my laptop and began trying to find the assignment and print it out. While I was sitting and waiting on my printout, I began to hear someone walking downstairs. I was confused as no one should be home, so I had called my boyfriend at the time and asked if he was home. He told me no, that he was on the way to class. I asked if his dad maybe came home, to which he replied his dad was just going into the meeting as he had just talked to him. As we were on the phone, I heard the noise from downstairs begin to head my direction, and I heard footsteps clearly stomping up the stairs. Now I got scared, but possibly thinking someone had broken into the home, and I just happened to be there. I told my boyfriend to stay on the phone with me. I heard footsteps get to the top of the hallway, and all of a sudden, stop outside of the door of the room I was in. I freaked out, ready to run or attack. One of the two. I opened the door to no one standing there. Absolutely no one was in the house. I then grabbed my assignments and have probably never ran so fast in my life. During our first home search, we looked at a lot of homes. We thought we wanted a particular style of home. We focused on those types of homes. Our realtor found one in the northern suburb of our town. The day arrived for the showing. The realtor opened the door. The house was empty. A few pieces of furniture remained. We did the standard tour, following her from room to room. The master bedroom was on the first floor. It had Berber carpet that was snagged and messed up. My husband and the realtor went back down the hall to the great room. As I continued to look at the carpet, I was bent down looking at the carpet. I saw the realtor go past the doorway and through the door to the basement. I stood up to follow her down the stairs. The lady had short black hair, a tan coat and gold earrings. Just as I was starting to go down to the basement, I realised that my husband and the realtor were upstairs. During this moment, I took my eyes off the lady and stopped. I did not proceed down the stairs. When I looked down the stairs, the lady had turned the corner. The realtor and my husband came down the stairs, saying the basement was next. The realtor went down the stairs. I followed, looking at the realtor. Her hair was different and her coat was not the same and no earrings. The basement was empty. All the lights were on and no one was down there. I was spooked. That had to be a prior owner. I faked a headache and called off the next showing. When we left the house, I saw the lady looking out the window at us. I told my husband what happened. He said the realtor told him the owner had passed away. I knew the lady died in that home. 
My tribe believes you cannot live in a home where someone died. The ghost was not malevolent, but I feel she was letting me know. She was present. My sister married a guy who was in law enforcement. During the beginning years of his career, they were posted to various small towns. One town was small, and so to attract candidates, they offered housing in a complex. This apartment complex was on the edge of this town. The complex is surrounded by farmland and some woods. This complex had apartments for the elderly and some subsidised apartments. Very brightly lit and relatively safe for these residents. Each apartment had a panic button. This town was so small they had no EMS. The cops came first and the nearest town would send a squad 15 minutes away. My sister just had her first child. This particular night, she was having a tough time getting the baby situated. The lights in the bedroom were off and only a hallway light was on. She was walking the baby and finally the baby drifted off to sleep. As she was bending over to put the baby in the bassinet, her eyes saw two red eyes staring at her. The window was closed and curtains pulled back with only the sheets down. My sister walked over and moved the curtains to see a face. The face was a man's face with lots of hair. Two large, unblinking red eyes just looking straight ahead. My sister stumbled backwards and hit that panic button. She got the baby and went to the front room. Her husband was on night shift duty. He rushed back as he pulled up to the apartment. He saw it. First it looked like a man but full of hair. It turned around and dropped to all fours. It took off to the farmlands. My brother-in-law chased it on foot. As he's on its tail, several people rushed up saying in Spanish, Wolfman. They had been working on farm equipment in a garage outbuilding that bordered the apartments. The Wolfman had stopped right in front of them. They saw a man's face with two big red eyes, but the body was hairy like a wolf. He saw just miles of dark farmland. He gave up on the chase. My brother-in-law returned to their apartment. He encounters a resident who complained about a large dog hanging around their apartment. My brother-in-law used a flashlight to check the ground near the windows. A mixture of animal and human footprints were near that window when my sister first saw it. My sister called my mother who came out with cedar. She burned and blew it away, smoke and prayer. My mum had a ceremony done. A relative of ours started practicing witchcraft. The relative was stalking everyone. Those years were pretty unnerving. I was in Ohio at the time. Each noise I heard at night, I would think it was him stalking me. The story happened to a member of our family, but on my father's side. His sister Vicky and her daughter Amy and husband Dan. They all live about an hour outside the county town where they reside. Amy and Dan lived on a farm in a less populated area. Dan worked a regular day job and Amy worked nights as a nurse. They had two little children after the move. Dan was killed in a traffic accident. Amy had the vehicle towed to the farm. It was placed in front of the house, but a ways from the front of the house. Trouble started during the wake and funeral for Dan. Both Aunt Vicky and Amy started seeing Dan sitting in the driver's seat at all times. Amy once walked up to the truck. When she got to the truck, empty. But yet, as my cousin walked to the truck, Aunt Vicky could still see Dan sitting in the truck. Amy found several white feathers during that week. When she walked to the truck to check to see who or what was sitting in the truck, this feather was placed on the truck hood. The second feather was found as Amy walked into the funeral home to arrange services. The third and final feather was found on the dining room table, the day of the funeral. Amy's house had weird happenings on the day of the funeral. The lower level door was closed but not locked. It was locked when Aunt Vicky and Amy left the house. The front door was open and unlocked. The gun safe had marks, someone tried to pry it open. Nothing was taken from the safe or the home. Condolence cards were scattered all over the floor off the dining room table, but the white feather was the only item on the table. They both stated that the condolence cards were stacked neatly on the table in piles, 
opened and unopened. Aunt Vicky called my mom to help. They were terrified to stay in that house. Amy couldn't understand why Dan would be terrorising the family. My mom performed her ceremony to determine what was going on with the house. She sang her peyote songs, burned sage and conversed with Dan. First, my mother stated that someone was watching the house. Across from the house was a tree line of undeveloped property. A specific tree had a Y shape. This person had been smoking, eating and sitting undisguised. Food wrappers, piles of butts. After the ceremony, the hiding spot was revealed to my aunt, mum and cousin. The happenings of the funeral date was an actual break-in. My mum told them the person was scared off and left in a hurry. He would not be back ever due to this ceremony. The feathers were from Dan to Amy. He was expressing his love, caring and saying goodbye. My mum told me that she did not tell my relatives. She saw why the burglar did not finish the crime. The burglar went through the bottom level door. The man closed the door and went directly to the gun safe. The person had been able to get the keys to the door and used a bag of tools for the safe. As the burglar was working to get the safe open, Dan materialised. Dan scared the hell out of the burglar. The burglar was pushed physically out of the house, hence why the cards were blown off the table. In the burglar's haste, he left the front door open. To say a final goodbye to Amy, he left the third feather for her. The reason my mom said none of this to my aunt and cousin, the burglar was their estranged son and brother. He was looking for some antique guns that he bought thought Amy and Dan possessed. The guns had been sold by my dead uncle prior to his passing. My mom turned the whole thing over to nature. Let nature exact justice. This male relative eventually lost everything in life, including his sanity. I have several experiences due to my mother's side of the family. My family is a mixture of Mississippi Choctaw and Dine. During my childhood, I experienced the spiritual side of the Dine religion. Medicine men, ceremonies, and living on the res. The females in our family have power. My mother is able to see and communicate with ghosts. She's able to perform ceremonies that she learned from her parents. They were both medicine people. My parents met in a city far from their homes. They went to BIA schools and earned degrees and certification for their respective careers. After graduation, they moved to a big city in Texas and got a house. Alright, here's my first story about my mom. Both of my parents worked. My dad worked for a big corporation on the outskirts of the city. My mother worked downtown for a private insurance company. She rode the bus line to get around. I went to a religious private school that provided after school care. My mother one day at work got violently ill. Her boss was very worried about her, so he took her home. Our home was in a suburb which at the time was quiet and didn't have a lot of natives in our neighbourhood. My mom got home and called my dad and asked him to pick me up. Mom told my dad not to worry and to come home at his regular time. My mom just decided to lie down in the living room, so she locked the house up. Since she didn't feel well, she didn't turn the TV or radio on. She remembers drifting off and had blankets on her, her trusty Pendleton. Mum woke up with a start. An old Dine lady dressed in formal clothing. Velveteen blouse and a pink shirt that was in emerald green. She wore her best jewellery squash blossom, two heavy bracelets and long beaded earrings. The woman was dressed to the nines in Dine culture. She had her hair up and covered with a green handkerchief. The woman had no face as she hovered over my mom. She had pulled up a dining room chair and sat down. The lady took her hand and reached for my mother's hand. She started to sing and chant the blessing way. My mom said she knew this voice, but it wasn't any of her large family. The old Dine lady's grip on my mother's hand was ice cold. My mother spoke Dine to her, asking her to let go. The lady said, not yet, not yet. Mama finally jerked her hand away. She got up and saw the chair was empty. The front door was open, but the storm door locked. The remnants of corn, pollen and cedar covered my mother's hair and around the couch. This woman knew my mama and was healing, but no one except my father and boss knew she was sick. 
My grandmother went and placed stones and it finally was revealed my mum's grandmother had done this. We moved into the home, redecorating normal things. My husband worked swing shifts and I worked day shifts, weekends off. I was home alone at night time often. I started to notice those weird knocking sounds outside hitting the house. It seemed like a regular occurrence. Then one day, the kitten stood straight on her back feet and growled, staring into the dining room. I got up, and as I walked into the room, those knocks, dings started up again. This room was the only room that the noises were present in. I decided to knock back if I heard it knock. A faint knock-knock like was coming from the basement. I knocked back hard. Waiting and listening, I received a hard return knock in the dining room. I headed downstairs to the basement. Only items in the area were our washer and dryer and dirty clothes. Nothing scary or weird but the knocks and pings coming from the dining room above. Now, I was annoyed at this knocking. I went back to the dining room and knocked in a pattern, once or three times, and waited for an answer. This ghost knocked twice back hard. My kitten Violet is now in the kitchen counter again, standing up on her back legs, growling. Violet can see it clearly. I decided to leave the house to drive to my husband's job site and tell him what was going on. He promised to look around when he got home. The knocks happened while he was looking around. The knocks continued off and on and still didn't say anything to my mom. Then one evening, we were home together watching a movie. We both dozed off. To me, it felt like my husband got off the couch. I opened my eyes and a man dressed in a grey sweatsuit stood before me. His head and hands were greyed out like old TV show. I quickly closed my eyes and opened. He was still standing in front of me. The face had not filled in. I yelled my husband's name. The figure vanished. My husband again checked the house. No sign of a man, knocks or pings. Made the call to my mom. They were planning to come out. I explained to her what was going on at the house. Mom advised me to burn cedar and blow out the operation. During that time waiting for them to arrive, I didn't stay at the house alone. Violet kept growling, even though the other two cats were starting to growl and looking at the dining room. My parents arrived and my mom asked to sleep in the bedroom over the dining room. After the third night visiting, mom said it's time. Mom announced after she performs a ceremony. Mom told us for three days after that we will not speak about it. She started singing Dine Peyote songs and walking the property in all the rooms of our house. During the prayer portion, a large clanging noise emerged from the dining room. The ceremony was plain simple and lasted roughly an hour. Three days later, we asked my mother what was going on. Mom stated there were two separate ghosts. The first was a boy who frequented the left side of the property line. Mom encountered him looking at the second story bedroom. This was the bedroom over the dining room. The boy was pelting rocks at the window and the walls. Mom asked the boy why. This young boy said I'm wanting to talk to my friend. And Mom said, your friend is gone. The pre previous owner of the house had one son. The young boy said he wanted to talk to him before he did it. By it, he meant he was going to kill himself. Mom told the boy it was all over. That day can't be relieved. The young boy didn't know he was dead. Mom helped him leave and go on to the light. This poor boy had been trapped, repeating the sad day over and over. He knocks and dings and pings him, trying to get our attention. To find his friend, as he tried that fateful sad day. The second ghost. The apparition was a person who lived here. He meant no harm, but loved the home dearly. Mom asked him not to appear like that. You're scaring the hell out of my daughter. Mom advised me to talk out the terms of staying here with us. We spoke to him and we're happy to have you here. We'll treat this house right. To this day, it's worked out between us. After my parents left, I asked my neighbour across the street about our west side neighbour. All this time we kept our distance from her. The widow was always drunk, loud and generally scary. We didn't know anything about the suicide and that had transpired. One year before we moved in, 
their son, the West Side neighbour, committed suicide in their basement. The mother had found him. We now understood her behaviour. After that, we've always been kind to her. You truly don't always don't know why people drink or abuse drugs. Now we do. I asked about our previous owner's son. If he was close to the deceased boy. Aaron, our owner's son, had been a very close friend to the deceased boy. They had grown up together. One added tidbit. A year from when my mom performed the ceremony, Aaron, the neighbor's son, was visiting other friends on the street. He came to our door and asked to look at the house, his old home. Aaron took us to each room and told us what updates his dad would appreciate. I asked Aaron which bedroom was his. It was the one my mom spent the night. Aaron looked out the window and talked about his childhood friend who used to pelt his window. Then Aaron stated his father always regretted leaving the house. We didn't know the father had passed away shortly after selling the house. This was my first solo dealings with ghosts in a home, but we all, my husband, my father and I, experienced the paranormal and the power that my mother has. My girlfriend's dad went to school in Kansas, actually right around the corner of the Sally house. In the mid 1990s, he and his baseball buddies all got a new professor who they all loved. The University of Benedictine, a Catholic university, at the time would provide a Victoria era home for all the professors and their families to stay in for free of charge. However, the catch was they would have to maintain the home and work on restoring the home. Well, their new professor was living in the home and the professor would frequently have him and his friends over to eat pizza, drink some beer and watch some TV. And after a month or so, they noticed the professor and his entire family began sleeping in his office. This understandably was very bizarre to them. So they asked him why they were doing this and the professor wouldn't provide an answer. So they just assumed something must be wrong with the house and tried to make sense of the situation the best they could. Then nearly a week later, the campus priest stopped him and his friends and said that he knew they were friends of the professor and they need to work on his lawn and help him out. He let the lawn go to shit when he left for his office. As they were working on his lawn, the professor and his wife showed up along with their daughter to get some more stuff and told them to leave. So they left and decided to pull some money together for a hotel room in another town so they could work on his yard and fix up the house a little bit. So the school would chill on him and so the professor and his family could relax too. The professor didn't want to accept but he did on one condition that they wouldn't go upstairs at all. So he and his family left town for a bit. When the professor left they fixed up the yard and painted some stuff in the house and of course, went upstairs as all college kids would. Then they decided to have some people over and drink at the professor's house because they said, fuck it. Toward the end of the night after the girls left, they heard a loud bang come from upstairs. They found a paint can left up there that was knocked down, but luckily the lid was on, so there wasn't a mess. But as they were taking their paint cans downstairs, they heard a noise from the little girls' room. Every toy was in a perfect circle looking at one another. One of the guys picked up a bear and threw it across the room and they all went back downstairs. They heard another bang and all went up to find the bear back in its place. They pieced together that the bangs were the doors slamming shut. Then they were getting freaked out, but they thought ghosts and all that was bullshit. So this time they threw the toys around everywhere until they all felt a burning sensation all over their body and in their eyes. They all ran out of the house and their backs all had scratches and their eyes were all turning bloodshot. They called the professor and told him what happened. He rejoiced that he and his family weren't crazy. It had happened to them too. That's why they fled the house. After that, the professor quit and the university shortly thereafter tore the house down. My freshman year of high school, my friends and I were really into playing with Ouija boards. I was always skeptical of whether or not they actually worked, until this experience. My friends and I had gotten word that a few people at our school had started a paranormal club. We were all pretty excited to hear about this, since we all into that type of stuff. 
A group of about nine of us decided to go to the first meeting held after school one day. When we showed up to the room where the meeting was held, we were surprised to find that it was just us and a few others as well as the two girls that had started the club, and the teacher chaperoning the meeting. One of the girls who started the club announced that for our first meeting, we were going to be watching an episode of Ghost Adventures, since I had some good paranormal encounters. My friends and I were pretty bummed that we were just watching a TV show. We expected to be doing something totally different. About 10 minutes into the episode, me and four of my other friends got bored. And since we were only 14 or 15 at the time, and couldn't leave until our parents picked us up, we decided to go hang out in one of our favourite teacher's rooms. We told the teacher we were at a paranormal club across the hall, and how we joined because we were into playing with Ouija boards. So my friend had the bright idea that we should play one in his room, since she knew how to make them. Our teacher was reluctant at first, but eventually just let us do it. My friend grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and scribbled down yes, no, and the letters and numbers. We got a makeshift planchette. I think we used like a quarter or something. We sat down at a table and started the game. We asked, are you there? And it slowly slid to yes. Then we asked, what is your name? It first slid to D, then O, then N. We quickly slid goodbye, since this wasn't our first time coming into contact with a spirit named Don. So a little backstory. This Don spirit had come through on multiple occasions when my friend Megan would play the Ouija board. He would say he was one of her family members who had passed, but upon asking her parents if they had a deceased relative named Don, they assured her they did not. So whenever Dom came on the Ouija board, we knew to just slide to goodbye and not talk to him, since we thought he was bad news. Right as we told Don goodbye, the paranormal club leaders had burst into the classroom, saying they'd been looking for us and asked why we were ditching their meeting. One of them walked closer to where we were sitting and saw the Ouija board. She started scolding us, telling us not to mess with Ouija boards, because there are bad spirits. We assured her that we knew what we were doing since we had done this so many times before. The girl sighed and let us get on with our game. She turned around to leave the room, but before she walked out, she told us about a girl who went to our high school back in the 90s or something and said she died nearby. She asked us if we were going to play with the Ouija board and if we could find out the girl's name. We agreed and both girls left the room. I'd like to emphasize the fact that none of us knew this girl's name let alone that there was a girl who died near the school. We thought it would be pretty cool if we could find out her name through the board, but didn't expect much. We then asked the Ouija board again, is anyone there? It stored for a minute and then slowly creeped to yes. I asked something along the lines of, there was a student who died here, what was her name? There was a long pause. Then the game started to piece to move. It first slid to S, then A, then R, then A, then H. Sarah. We all froze for a moment. My friend Megan broke the silence eventually by asking the board, what's your name? It spelled out Don. We all slid the planchette to goodbye as fast as we could. We then started joking about Megan's so-called relative, Don, and how he was always trying to mess with us. A few minutes passed, and the leader from the paranormal club came into our classroom again from across the call. She said, hey guys, we did some research on the internet and we figured out the girl's name. It was Sarah. All our jaws dropped. I immediately started getting goosebumps. I'd like to remind you that none of us had any prior knowledge of this girl who passed away since it happened about 20 years prior. We told her that Sarah was the name we got when we asked the Ouija board. She got excited and told me and my friends to follow her across the hall. We looked at the computer she had been doing her research on and sure enough, Sarah's obituary was pulled up on the screen. She was struck by a car while attempting to cross the main road near our school. The girl also said, and this chilled me to my core, that she found another obituary for a janitor who worked at my high school in the 90s and committed suicide. His name? Don. I was haunted in the past by a little girl. She beat me in my sleep. She's gone now. And for years, that was it. No harm done. Recently, it could be the past couple of years. Every so often, I'd be torn out of a deep sleep, straight out of it, 
and my attention would always be on one part of the room. And more often than not, there'd be a figure there. The figures used to have no physical distinguishable traits. They were a black shrouded mass. When I'd wake up and see them, they'd quickly disappear and that was that. But they've been getting gradually clearer, becoming more defined, and they're not the same spirit each time. They've been getting closer too, and taking longer to disappear. This one, only a few minutes before writing this, at about 2.57am, tore me out of a deep sleep and was a stride length away from the end of my bed. I woke up, saw it in its black robes, its arms hidden, like a monk when they put their hand into each robe. Its face was white and twisted into a smile. It was eight feet tall and it was staring directly at me. I moved towards my lamp and its face followed me, clearly watching me. Only when I reached for the lamp and realized what I was doing, did it take a quick step back. Then it disappeared when the light came on. I've never been worried about these before, but the past two have been the clearest and this is the first one to actually move away from me when I reached for the light. Something is clearly waking me up before they get to me, but the fact that they're getting clearer, closer and able to move is really fucking with me. So a good few years ago, I'd say maybe seven years ago when I was 18, my dad got me a World War II air raid siren for Christmas. It was seriously cool, and I took it outside immediately to give it a go. It made the typical eerie air raid siren sound. I loved it. Now, nothing happened for a long time, but then I started feeling as if I was being watched, usually at night. Then one Friday, I was gaming with my friends on Xbox Live, and in the middle of a game, I saw someone standing to my right next to the air raid siren. I turned to look and there's this little girl in a white nightdress and long black hair facing away from me and towards the door. I was speechless. She was completely solid, like a real person. And I could even see her shoulders rise and fall as she breathed. Yet she said and did nothing. She just stood there. For the whole time she was there, I couldn't look away. I couldn't talk or anything. Then when she was gone, I returned to the Xbox chat and told my friends what I saw and we joked. I felt creeped out, but nothing else. Now this has happened several more times. Each time she appeared, I couldn't do anything except stare at her. My friends said to film her or shelter her, but I just couldn't. And this was happening at random times throughout the day. Once was midday. Each time I saw her, she was facing away from me. I never saw her face, but she was always getting closer to my bed. One time there was a woman standing with her, but she was also facing away from me and towards the door. None of my family paid any attention to me about her until I started waking up with nosebleeds, black eyes, and bruises all over my body. I looked like I'd partaken in a fight club. I was getting these beatings nightly. On one occasion, my sister and her boyfriend heard a girl giggling and ran across her bedroom. That was the only time the ghost girl seemed to visit any of my family. Now because of the beatings, my mum contemplated getting a priest in to bless the air raid siren in hope of putting an end to it. But my dad did some research, and according to where the air raid siren had been stationed back in the day and kept, no one had died near it to become attached to it. I never told my girlfriend at the time about the ghost girl because I knew she'd never come round. So one night, we'd curled up in my bed. It's a single bed. She's by the wall and I'm on the edge. And as I'm nearly falling off, I tell her to move over. Now stupid old me, I said the wrong girl's name. As I'm sure you can all understand, if your partner said the wrong name, you wouldn't be too happy. So she rolls over to have a go at me and immediately turns back around and starts sobbing into the bed, refusing to look back towards me. I get up, turn the light on and ask her why she's crying, still thinking it's because I said the wrong name. When she finally and slowly looked up, she was as pale as snow and was staring past me at the edge of the bed. This is when she told me that when she turned over towards me, there was a little girl in a white nightdress and long black hair standing directly behind me and staring down at her. I freaked the fuck out. After that night, I moved the air raid siren into the barn and immediately I could feel her presence gone from my room in the house. It was as if she couldn't get in. Whenever I go out into the barn, I can feel her there. Sometimes I see her standing near the siren. 
I can feel her outside my bedroom window now and again. But she can't get in and she can't hurt me. About three years ago, I went hiking in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. Since I didn't speak Arabic and my phone didn't receive data in Morocco, I decided to hire a guide. He suggested that we hike Jebel Yagor. It was a smaller mountain, but I was told that it had an excellent view. About a quarter of the way up the mountain, I suddenly couldn't hear anything. I thought I was about to pass out and I sat down quickly. As I sat there, I realized I wasn't lightheaded. My vision was perfectly fine and I began to stand back up. I took a step forward, but I couldn't hear my foot hit the rocky ground beneath it. I took another step forward and then I once again could hear everything. I could hear my guide call out to me and ask if I was okay. I could hear the wind again and I could hear the voices of other people further up the mountain. I turned around and stepped back where I was standing a moment prior and again I heard nothing. I slammed my foot into the ground trying to make a sound but I still heard nothing. I picked up a small rock and threw it downward but still nothing. I eventually stepped forward again and called for my guide to come to me. I asked him to stand where I was a moment ago. He looked at me weird, but he stood there and I saw his eyes get wide. He took two steps forward very quickly and asked what just happened. I told him I'd hoped he know, but he'd had no idea. He seemed really spooked, even more so than me, and suggested we keep hiking. On the way up the mountain, we talked about how weird our experience was, and I decided to try to find the same spot on the way down. Once we reached the top and hiked back down, I tried standing in the same spot as earlier. The problem was that the spot looked like every other part of the mountain surrounding it. I spent about 30 minutes looking for the spot, but I couldn't find it. I know it's a long shot, but has anyone ever experienced something similar? Even better, has anyone experienced this on Jebel Yagor?